Hey guys, and welcome back to Sage and Stone Homestead. My name is Heather, if you haven't met me yet, and I am gardening in southwestern Kentucky, zone 7B. We've got a raised bed garden and a greenhouse and do garden tours every Tuesday. This is the sixth garden tour of the 2022 season and things are really starting to happen. The tomatoes here in the greenhouse are starting to yellow a little bit. This is the first yellowing that I have seen since we really started growing in here. See, here's a good example. And I, I believe I learned on Luke's channel from MI Gardener that if you have yellow leaves with green veins that you have a nitrogen deficiency. So I need to be treating in here. We have the entire greenhouse set up on a drip irrigation system and I do have a fertilizer injector. So the plan is to set up that drip irrigation system and run some fish emulsion. That is a hard word to say. Fish emulsion <laughs> fertilizer through the lines. It's a liquid fertilizer and it's mainly composed of nitrogen. Nutrients like phosphorus are what's responsible to put blooms on plants and to host some nice fruit development. We have plenty of that going on, so I think all they really need is the nitrogen. See that? And though really the main point of tomatoes is the fruit and not the leaves, the leaves do need to be healthy in order to transfer good energy from the sun into the fruit development. So we've got to take care of the entire plant, not just the part that we harvest. Do you see how these plants, these peppers, are much taller than these peppers down here? The ones back here are actually jalapenos, and down here is some overflow that I had from our green pepper row. So down here, these guys are just regular old green bell peppers. I completely forgot that I stuck the extras in the jalapeno row until they started putting on their fruit. I could really tell. See that little guy in there? That is not a jalapeno. These, however, those are jalapenos. See? Looking good. Look at how neat these are, guys. The different colors that you see on this plant aren't related to nutrient deficiencies. This is actually a variegated pepper. The neat color differences that you see on here are just part of the genetics. Our one surviving bean plant in here is doing its thing. I have tried to plant bush beans in the greenhouse twice now, and each time it seems that they're being taken out by slugs as little seedlings. Sometimes that's one of the downsides to woven weed fabric like this. A lot of the times it provides a place for bugs to hide underneath and they can be a little bit hard to get rid of. During the second planting of the green beans, I did sprinkle coffee grounds around each planting hole and it didn't seem to help. I really got basically zero germination that time. I got germination. I saw tiny seedlings, but I didn't see them for very long before they were just gone. Let's see here. So I think I'm going to forego trying to do bush beans in the greenhouse right now because I do have some space opening up in the raised bed garden and I know that the slug pressure in there is basically slim to none. This is the bed that I can open up in order to give some space for bush beans in the garden. This week we have high temperatures topping out at 99 degrees Fahrenheit and there's really no sense in taking any brassica through that temperature. It's just going to trigger them to flower. Our purple cabbages here are not as big as I would like, but it looks like we're not going to have any time to really get them to grow any bigger before the hot weather hits. I actually got way more cabbage this year than I have in years prior. So these smaller heads are really no big deal. See, not too bad really. Not 
too shabby, honestly. Cabbages and other plants where really the main thing that you harvest is the leaves are nitrogen heavy feeders, meaning they take up a lot of nitrogen out of the soil as they grow. Beans and other legumes on the other hand are actually nitrogen fixing. So they remove nitrogen from the air and actually put it down into their root system. And when you then remove the beans from the ground, you can cut them off at the base, much like I did here with these cabbages and all of that nitrogen is then left in the soil for future crops. So I don't plan on amending this bed before I plant some bush beans. I'm just gonna go ahead and do it. Probably not today because I'm chasing a storm right now to get this video done, but we'll see. I'm actually amazed with how little cabbage looper damage I saw on those red cabbages with these monstrosities right next door. Look at all of this damage. This is super bad news. I'm not really worried about it right now. They're coming out today. Look at this one. Look at the stock on it. It's beautiful. Another plant that simply isn't going to tolerate the heat that we have coming up this week is the kale. Our lettuces back here have already started to bolt, which is going to seed. I'm gonna let them do that, but I have kale seed coming out my ears. I don't need this to go to seed. I'd rather harvest what I can. So what I'm gonna do first is make sure that this is still good. And I wanna make sure that I'm not getting a whole bunch of cabbage loopers on here. Actually, this kale looks really good. I don't think it's really wormy. But also, it has been pretty hot leading up to today and this coming week, which is going to be warmer. And I wanna make sure that the greens haven't gone bitter. No bitter flavor at all. So I'm gonna go ahead and harvest all of this kale. All I'm really doing is basically taking the center of the stalk and twisting it and snapping off the more tender inner leaves. Most of these outer leaves are probably also fine to eat, but sometimes as they get bigger, they get tougher and there's so much kale here that I don't think I really have to be picky. So what's left in the garden now are really things that I could use some seed from, like this spinach and some lettuces. And then this here is Swiss chard. This is a heat loving green. It is experiencing a little bit of bug damage, but I'd like to see how it does once I get the rest of this kale removed. It might bounce back. It's going to be a busy week of cool weather crop preserving for me, but I really look forward to it. I haven't ever canned greens before, but that's what I plan to do with the rest of this kale. I've got a lot in the freezer. I'm running out of freezer space, so I really can't afford to freeze any of this. With the purple cauliflower, I plan to ferment that. It is delicious. If you have never fermented cauliflower, please give it a try. And then over here, I actually got the suggestion to make canned coleslaw out of all of this cabbage. Super great idea. I will probably also make some sauerkraut as well. Over here, these melons are getting some afternoon shade courtesy of the glorious large tomato plants. And this is actually the Charente melon. This one is a lot like cantaloupe. It is definitely different. It's a lot more floral and it's a much smaller fruit with a different kind of skin on it. Over on this side of the bed, I did plant some Kajaris. I had actually tried to divide up the Kajaris that germinated more than one plant per hole, and they didn't really do too well with being separated. A lot of cucurbit plants like melons and cucumbers really don't do well with their roots being disturbed. And so some of our Kajaris are a little bit sad looking right now. I'm really hoping they bounce back. If they don't, we still have plenty of time left in the season to plant some more. There's another one, and there's one right here. Last week, we actually planted some cucumbers in this bed. So instead of dividing up the extras, I'll show you how I thin these plants out. So as you can see, every plant in this planting hole has germinated. I'm gonna pick the one that looks the best. Really, they all look the same here. And I'm just gonna pinch off at the top two of the plants. That's really the best way to thin out seedlings without disturbing the roots. It's super simple. And now that one plant that's left won't be starved for nutrients and will get the most out of it. You definitely can plant just one seed per hole when you're in the garden. I just wanted to make sure that we were definitely going to get cucumbers out of that. Plus I can always save seed. So it was worth it to me to put more than just one seed.
I think it was in the last video where I stood here and I said, the tomatoes are getting really tall and it was basically the same height as me. <laughs> now I can barely touch the top. <laughs> this plant has grown at least 18 inches in one week. That's insane. And they're at the point where we're even getting some little tomatoes at eye level, which is always fun when you have your tomatoes on a trellis like this. And some of the big ones are sure getting big. So you see this at the bottom of this tomato? At first glance, you might look at this tomato and think that it has blossom end rot. And blossom end rot is a result of a lack of calcium in the soil. This is actually not blossom end rot. If I do happen to come across it, I'll show you. But this is actually, I wanted to say a condition, but it's probably not technically a condition, but it's called cat facing and it's really common on heirloom tomatoes. And this is an heirloom tomato variety called Belgian giant. And it's really just caused by an irregular shaped blossom and doesn't really hurt the plant at all. All of the fruit with cat facing is perfectly harvestable. Those parts that are a little bit brown and dry right now, they won't really heal and be something edible, but they're super easy to cut out. And these tomatoes are definitely worth growing despite that. I noticed that this one is actually stuck between two liters. This one also has some cat facing on it. The tomato behind it is actually stuck between the leader and the cattle panel. These are going to be some squished tomatoes. But I noticed about these two tomatoes here specifically that they are starting to get a creamy, yellowy tint to them. So I think we have the hints of ripening happening. So they are starting to soften up a little bit. So it shouldn't be long now and we'll be harvesting tomatoes. Usually every year, the first type of tomato that we have to ripen is a cherry type. I don't know if these are technically cherry or plum varieties, they're quite large. These are the black strawberry tomato. And then we have more Brad's Atomic Grape. Oh, it fell off. Definitely not ready yet. Not bad by any means. Super good. Definitely needs some time to ripen. it. <laughs> Blackberries are still coming along. Isn't this onion blossom so neat? Wow. That is a very odd combination of oniony and floral. You just have to smell it to understand it. <laughs> I don't know if I like it or not. <laughs> Look what I saw. I actually thought the bee bomb was supposed to be red. I have seen a lot of hummingbirds in the garden and I imagine that this bee bomb is gonna be their favorite. This smells so much better than the onion bloom. <laughs> Check out the flower cluster on this elderberry plant. This is awesome and I can't wait until this whole thing is all berries. I might have to try to net them away from the birds, but we'll see what happens. <sighs> the smells keep getting better. Looky here. This particular section of pole beans was an heirloom bean that was actually sent to me by a subscriber. Marianne, your beans, they're coming on. She said that they were very, very prolific and it looks like she didn't lie. In the throes of bean harvesting season, we are out here getting buckets and buckets full of beans every two days. These beans have such a lovely, light, crisp, very sweet flavor. There's no strings in them at all. Sometimes the downfall of a lot of pole bean varieties is that they have this really hard, tough string that goes down the seam of each side of the bean. These are not doing that to me. These are wonderful. Our mystery squash over here, the lovely volunteer that I'm so glad came to us this year, has started to set little fruits. That is no butternut like I thought it may be. There's one there. And there's quite a few in here. 
I'm kind of hoping it's a sweet meat variety of pumpkin that I planted a couple years ago, but I don't know. We're just going to have to wait. I have been coming through here and searching just about every morning for squash bugs and squash bug eggs. It can be a pretty daunting task to try to look under and on top of each leaf. Generally, the squash bugs like the lower leaves to lay their eggs, but I have seen squash bug eggs on some of the upper leaves as well. You can just brush the eggs off. I just remove the entire leaf and get the leaf as far away from the squash plant as possible. More than squash bugs, our biggest problem with squash here is the squash vine borer, and those actually lay a very similar shaped and colored egg but it's a single egg and it's usually along the stem I haven't seen those yet and I'm crossing my fingers that they don't come but I just know that that's not realistic we're going to see those at some point because our volunteer plant here did volunteer amidst some strawberries I'm wondering if the strawberry leaves here are gonna confuse the squash vine borer because I haven't seen any eggs or damage yet It's a hot one. Thank you so much for joining me in the garden again this week. Next week, hopefully we'll be able to harvest some ripe cherry tomatoes, fingers crossed, and some beans. To stay in the loop, make sure that you've subscribed to the channel and turned on notifications. And if you'd like to catch up on what's been going on this garden season, here's the Tour Tuesday playlist.